Hello, and welcome to our webinar, SSI and Social Work Incentive Rules, Understanding the Effect of Work on SSI and Social Security Disability Benefits, offered by the National Association of State Head Injury Administrators. I'm Carrie Bennett, Chair of NASH's Training and Education Committee, and Gabriella Lawrence Soto is our webinar organizer. Thank you for joining us. If you're unfamiliar with NASHA, we are a nonprofit organization created to assist state government in promoting partnerships and building systems to meet the needs of individuals with brain injury and their families. A go-to webinar user guide is available for download from the NASHA website. This is a great resource for making the most of your live webinar experiences. Our objectives for today's webinar are to explain the SSI and SSDI program history and purpose, to explain the basics of eligibility for SSI and including substantial gainful activity used to determine disability status, and to understand that individuals eligible for SSI and SSDI can try work without immediate loss of benefits when their wages will affect their benefits and their reporting responsibilities to SSA. Before we launch our presenter, we have a poll question for you. Please select one of the following. How familiar are you with SSI and SSDI work incentive rules? Completely familiar, or completely unfamiliar, somewhat familiar, or very familiar. Gabby, do we have the results of our poll? Gabby, oh, there they are. Uh, I would say the majority of our participants today, 68% are somewhat familiar with SSI and SSDI work incentive rules. We do have a few that are completely unfamiliar and about 12% that are very familiar. So um, Linda will do her very best to give a, a little bit of an overview at the beginning and then um, get more detailed as she goes. Thank you, Gabby, for the poll question. And now I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Linda L. Landry. She's a senior attorney with the Disability Law Center of Massachusetts. Linda has worked at the Disability Law Center since 1990. Her focus is on Social Security benefit issues and work incentives, as well as the related health benefits, Mass Health and Medicare. She has over 30 years of experience in legal advocacy in these areas, which has included individual representation, training, impact, and policy work, class action litigation and backup, support, and technical assistance to a statewide project of attorneys and advocates who represent individual Social Security and SSI disability benefits claimants. She writes and presents on a variety of topics for local and national audiences. She's a graduate of Northeastern University School of Law and worked at Neighborhood Legal Services in the 1980s before coming to DLC. She received the National Organization of Social Security Claimants Representatives Distinguished Service Award in 2006, the Massachusetts Bar Association Equal Access to Justice Award in 2011, and a Massachusetts Top Women of the Law Award in 2013. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, Carrie. I'm delighted to be here. 
and uh, welcome everyone to the to the webinar. Uh, we've got a lot of material to present, and I hope you will find it um, useful. Uh, I do have to give a disclaimer that uh, the slides we're going to see and the issues we're going to talk about um, really because of the time constraints cannot include all the details that may apply to individual cases. And um, as you'll see as we go through the slides, there are uh, important numbers that um, trigger uh, eligibility or ineligibility um, that change every year with the every January with the cost of living uh, raising benefits so um, so it's always important to check in uh, on details uh, and uh, and sometimes the changes that uh, that can occur in the regulations as well as these uh, monetary changes every January with that said um, I would like to start out with just an basic overview of the benefits administered by the Social Security Administration, which I'm going to refer to as SSA. It is a federal agency that administers two different types of cash benefits um, for uh, people who uh, meet its disability standard and uh, for people who are aged or of retirement age. Um, it's important to know the type of benefit that someone receives in order to understand the effect of work on the benefits. Um, so the two types of benefits are uh, what I call Social Security Insurance and Supplemental Security Income. And we'll talk about each one of them uh, a little bit before we dive into the work incentives. Each one of them has a completely different set of work incentive rules. and. So in order to help someone understand the effect of work on the benefits, you really need to know which benefit it is that the person receives. Uh, so what is Social Security Insurance? Uh, it's an old program. It started out as a New Deal program in the 1930s. It was, uh, it's a statutory program created by Congress under Title II of the Social Security Act. It is a compulsory work-related program based on insurance principles that's designed to partially replace earnings lost due to disability or retirement. And it is not a needs-based benefit. Uh, it doesn't have income and asset tests. But as you will see, at some point, earnings from work um, can, can decide whether a person is, is eligible for, for a benefit in any particular month. Social Security insurance benefits are available to adults, and for Social Security purposes, an adult is a person who's age 18 or older. Uh, there's a retirement benefit um, for uh, folks who have worked long enough and paid into the system long enough, but people who are unable to work due to disability or blindness prior to retirement age can get a disability benefit. That's the benefit that we call SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance. In this program, there are also dependence benefits for certain close family members of a retired or disabled individual who is receiving benefits. And if the wage earner has died, these benefits for certain close family members are called um, survivor's benefits. And at the bottom bullet on the slide, you can see that uh, I've cited some of the regulations involving uh, who's eligible for one of these benefits, including dependents and survivors. Uh, 20 Code of uh, Federal Regulations, Part 404, are where we find the Title II regulations. And uh, the, sub, the sub numbers are for the specific uh, sections that apply to this slide. Um, you earn a Social Security insurance benefit, as I intimated earlier, by working and paying FICA. Uh, on the social on on one's wages uh, in 2017 it's necessary to earn thirteen hundred dollars uh, per quarter uh, in order to begin to uh, earn insured status um, so that's uh, for this year fifty two hundred dollars for all four quarters that one can earn in a year um, and in prior years, the amount one needed to earn a quarter of coverage uh, was less. This is another one of those numbers that goes up every January. So monthly benefits that a person can be eligible for who has worked and 
paid the FICA taxes on their wages are dependent on the worker wage history of the of the individual and are unique to each worker. Um, so people who have a longer work history within higher wages will have a larger benefit than people uh, who've had a shorter work history, perhaps when folks have had their uh, work cut short due to disability, um, and also folks who worked in lower wage work. There is a maximum benefit, and that's another one of those numbers that changes every January. In 2017, it's $2,687 uh, per month. can be a little higher than that if one delays retirement age, but, but that is the basic maximum. Uh, the dependents' benefits are, are paid separate from the wage earner's benefit. There's a separate pot of money that Social Security calculates on top of the wage earner's to maximum benefit amount, totaling about 50% of the worker's benefits. Uh, and these, these are potentially payable to folks who are eligible as dependents. Um, so who can get Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI? SSDI is one of those Social Security insurance um, benefits that pays a month, monthly cash benefit to people who are disabled under Social Security's standard. And by the way, Social Security uses the same definition of disability for SSDI as it does for SSI. The main requirement besides disability for SSDI is the person that the individual applicant worked and FICA covered work paid those FICA taxes, uh, for long enough to have, in, have insured status. For most adults, this means working for about five out of the past 10 years. There is um, a lesser work uh, insurance standard for uh, people under age 31, so that younger people can be eligible as well. Um, so that's the end of the overview on SSD. I did want to mention that Medicare is the health insurance uh, that comes with Title II disability benefits. Most people have to wait for 24 months of eligibility um, for SSDI uh, before Medicare kicks in. And it comes in automatically. Social Security counts the months and sends people notices when, um, when their Medicare will start. Um, it is not a needs-based benefit either. Um, the only exceptions to the 24-month waiting period are for people who are eligible based on um, ALS, which is called Lou Gehrig's disease, or end-stage renal disease. Uh, Medicare does come uh, uh, with the first month of eligibility for Title II retirement benefits at full retirement age. And full retirement age is um, between age 65 and 67 for folks these days, depending on your birth year. All right, so let's let's move to a brief overview of SSI. This is Supplemental Security Income. This is a newer program than the Social Security Insurance um, programs. This was created by statute in 1972 when Congress passed Title 16 of the Social Security Act. Um, this program was created when it had become abundantly clear that there were many people who didn't have enough work history in FICA-covered work to have enough to live on at retirement age or if they became unable to work due to disability or blindness prior to retirement age. It is a low-income program. It has strict, uh, it's, it's a needs-based benefit and it has strict income and asset rules. So the asset limit for an SSI benefit, whether you're eligible on the basis of age or disability, is um, $2, less than $2,000 in countable assets if you're a single individual, and less than $3,000 if you're a member of a married couple. Um, the income limit is really based on having less countable income then the benefit amount, and as you'll see in a minute, the maximum benefit amount in 2017 uh, is $735 per month. There is no work history needed for eligibility. Some people may have worked, uh, have a work history sufficient for SSDI, but their SSDI benefit may be less than the amount they could get on SSI, and in that case, people will be eligible for uh, the SSDI and um, uh, an additional amount of SSI as a supplement uh, up to the maximum SSI that they could receive. 
Categorical SSI eligibility is uh, folks who are eligible on the disability standard that SSA uses, or the same for blind individuals age 0 to 65. So children can be eligible for SSI based on disability as well as adults. Uh, retirement age in SSI is still 60, uh, for people 65 and older. Um, and SSI has strict immigration status eligibility requirements. Um, so in order to be SSI eligible, you both have to be disabled or blind or an elder, 65 or older. You must have low assets, less than the countable limits you see on this slide. And you also must have less countable income than the maximum benefit amount that SSI pays. And you must either be a citizen or meet really restrictive immigrant eligibility status requirements. Um, most states do provide Medicaid um, to SSI recipients. Uh, many states provide it automatically to SSI recipients. Some states require um, a separate application. Uh, important to check in your state if, if that's important for you to know how your state manages SSI, uh, Medicaid for SSI recipients. As I said earlier, the, the SSI maximum benefit amount is only $735 a month in 2017. And of course, in prior years, um, it was less. The monthly, the maximum monthly amount that of SSI that people can get does depend on the individual's living arrangement, whether the um, individual is single or married. There is a marriage penalty in the SSI program, and whether the recipient has any other income. Uh, we don't have time in this webinar to talk about all the details of this, but do be aware that. Uh, the SSI maximum benefit amount can vary a lot depending on these factors. In addition, some states decided back in 1972 to supplement the SSI federal benefit rate with state money. In some states, uh, that will be paid, uh, administered by Social Security and paid in the same check as the federal benefit amount. And some states have decided to administer the state supplement themselves. And uh, so the people will get uh, a second check uh, with the state supplement in those states. And again, um, states had considerable latitude to decide how to supplement um, the uh, state, the federal benefit rate. And that's something else that would need to be checked in every state. Um, you know, all of these eligibility criteria that we've talked about, the, the income, the assets, the living arrangements, um, the immigrant status or citizenship all require, any changes in these require reporting to Social Security uh, on an ongoing basis. Here's a quick overview of SSI income and asset uh, counting rules. Most income that an SSI recipient receives in a month counts to reduce the amount of SSI that the individual can receive. There are different deductions that apply to different types of income. As we'll see in a few minutes, earnings from work are favored with large deductions. And this is the main work incentive in the SSI program. Unearned income, which is anything other than wages from work, is not favored. There's only a $20 per month deduction from total monthly unearned income. There's also something called in-kind income. When SSI recipients or applicants receive food or shelter-related costs for free or at a reduced cost. Shelter-related costs are things like rent and mortgage, um, utilities, uh, things like that. So either uh, people get a break on those from a friend or relative or someone else helps them pay it. And so that, that is an in-kind income. Um, deduction. I will say that, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, subsidy in, in subsidized housing doesn't count as in-kind income. Uh, in addition, income and resources can be deemed from uh, certain people, uh, including spouses and a parent uh, to a minor child or a sponsor to a sponsored uh, non-citizen. And income is always counted in the month of receipt for SSI purposes. But you always have to think of income twice in the SSI program, because 
income is counted in the month of receipt uh, under the income rules, and if it's not spent down as of the first moment of the following month, it goes towards countable resources. Countable resources for SSI purposes include cash or other liquid resource assets, real or personal property that the individual owns and has legal access to to convert, convert to cash and use for their basic, basic needs. Uh, not all assets are accountable, countable resources, and you can see some examples uh, in the bullet points at the bottom of this slide. A home the individual owns and lives in, ordinary household goods and personal effects, one vehicle of any value per family. Others are, are accountable to their equity value and certain burial, burial funds. Again, there are a lot of details um, on these rules that we can't get to today, but I think this gives you a sense of, of uh, the restrictions in the SSI program. So I'm going to start now with the Title 16 SSI work incentives. Um, it, it is the work incentives in the SSI program are all about how much of a person's earnings are going to count to reduce uh, the amount of SSI that they could otherwise receive. Um, you'll hear about SGA in a substantial gainful activity in relationship to SSDI in a few minutes, but once people who are eligible for SSI, SGA never applies again. It's really about the deductions you can get from your earnings. And on this slide, slide 14, you can see a list of the uh, deductions from earnings that an SSI recipient can receive. And we'll talk about each one of these. Uh, the first is the student earned income exclusion, which is a great exclusion for youth uh, designed to give um, uh, youth with disabilities, an opportunity for to get those early work experiences that are so important to later employment. And to get those work incentives, those work experiences, without fear of losing SSI and, um, and Medicaid. Uh, the more common one that you'll see is $65 and half of the remainder. That's the major uh, SSI work incentive. And we're going to see an example of how that works. Then there are deductions for something called impairment-related work expenses. There are blind work expenses for people, a deduction for people who are eligible on the basis of blindness. Then there's the plan to achieve self-support, which we call PASS. And then there's something called expedited reinstatement for people who successfully work their way off of SSI. Let's start with the earned income exclusion, the general one. Um, Again, this, this is the, it is how much of your earnings from work are excluded that is, that is important when an, an SSI recipient goes to work. Uh, a good estimate of the exclusion is about half of gross monthly earnings count against the SSI benefit. The other way to say it is about half of gross monthly work earnings uh, are excluded and do not count. The actual formula is $65 plus half of the remainder of that math operation. And in addition, the $20 general earned income deduction can be used if it's not used on unearned income. And I think we have an example coming up. Carmen lives by herself in a rent subsidized apartment and she receives $735 a month in SSI disability benefits in 2017. She has no other income. She takes a job that pays $885 in gross wages per month. So the question is, what is the effect on her SSI? Will she still be eligible for SSI with $885 in gross wages per month? And the answer is yes. Only $400 of Carmen's gross monthly wages of $885 are going to reduce her SSI benefit. And the math starts, you can see the formula starting in the top bullet on the slide. You start with the $885 in gross wages, and we deduct $85 in this case. She gets the $65 plus the $20 general, dis general deduction because she didn't have any other er unearned income to use it on. That leaves us uh, with $800. And you, then you divide that by two. That's the half of the rest part. 
So that leaves us with $400 in countable income. So her new SSI benefit will be $735, which is the maximum for her, minus $400, which leaves us with $335. She remains eligible for some SSI. Uh, she remains eligible for Medicaid in states that provide Medicaid to SSI recipients. And her total gross monthly income is now much larger than $735. It's $1,220. Uh, so it's fairly easy to explain to SSI recipients the effect of wages on their benefit, especially when they only receive SSI and have no other income. Let's look at an example for someone who did have a work history uh, but has a low benefit um, and it also gets SSI as the supplement. Um, this is Joe. Joe also lives by himself in a rent subsidized apartment. He gets $520 in SSDI. Uh, this could also be disabled adult child benefits, one of those uh, dependence benefits that's available uh, to certain close family members of um, retirement or disability benefit recipients. Uh, because the $520 he receives in SSDI is less than the amount of SSI he could receive, he receives $235 in SSI disability benefits as a supplement in 2017. He also takes the same job that pays $885 per month in gross wages. Um, unlike Carmen, these wages make him SSI ineligible. And we can see the math on the following slide. Uh, when people have other income, you have to treat the streams differently and give them their different deductions. So in Joe's case, we start out with his $520 in SSDI. We deduct $20. That leaves us with $500 in countable SSDI, which is unearned income. We then start with his $885 in gross wages. We, um, for SSI purposes, we use the $65 deduction. He doesn't get the $20 deduction here because he used it on his SSDI. That leaves us with $820 in wages. We then divide that by two because that's the other half of the main uh, work, uh, SSI work incentive deductions. That leaves us with $410 in countable wages. Next, we have to total his countable uh, income. So we add $500, which is his countable unearned income, SSDI, plus $410, which is his countable, uh, S, uh, his countable wages for $910. And this is more than the SSI payment amount for his living arrangement. He was only getting uh, $235 to begin with. So you can see that people who are eligible for less SSI because they have other countable income lose their, benefit, their SSI faster. Uh, when they have wages. So Joe does lose his SSI, but his total gross income um, with the wages is now um, $1,405 as opposed to um, $520 alone. He may still be eligible for Medicaid uh, in your state, depending on, on um, the type, uh, how your state uh, manages his Medicaid program. All right, now let's look at the student earned income deduction. This is available for SSI recipients who are under age 22 and regularly attending school. In 2017, the student earned income deduction is $1,790 per month up to uh, a maximum of $7,200 per calendar year. So this is an enormous deduction. Uh, that youth uh, who, are, who are in school under age 22 can take. Uh, this deduction is also in addition to the regular earned income deduction, $65 and half of the rest, and the other deductions that we're going to look at. So this is a, this is a terrific tool for youth with disabilities um, to get uh, early, as I said, early uh, work experiences without fear of losing their SSI and their SSI-related Medicaid. Another common deduction is something called impairment-related work expenses. Um, these, are, um, these can be deducted from gross monthly earnings in, in addition to the regular earned income deduction and the student earned income deduction if a person is eligible for that. 
an impairment related work expense, we call it ERWIS, um, are impairment related items and services. So this could be uh, health care, for example, uh, that's needed in order to work, that's out of pocket, meaning that it's not covered by insurance and not reimbursed by anyone, out of pocket to the, to the, to the benefit recipient, and it's, it's incurred in a month when working. I shouldn't have said paid on this slide. It doesn't necessarily have to have been paid, but it has to have been incurred in a month when the person uh, is working. And some examples we can see here are service animal expenses, uncovered medical expenses, including co-pays, acupuncture, uh, which is not always covered by Medicaid programs, and uh, transportation to work that is made necessary due to disability. Um, so these are important deductions. People do have to keep the um, receipts and report these um, expenses to Social Security in order to get advantage of the, uh, of the deduction. For individuals who are eligible basis on blindness, there are separate work, work, sorry, work expense deductions. Uh, and these are really a list, and they don't necessarily have to be uh, proven to be disability related like the IRWIs do. So examples of blind work expenses include service animal expenses, transportation to and from work, um, taxes that come out of one's check, attendant care services, visual aids, translation of materials into Braille, lunches, and professional association dues. Um, so these, these again, are only available to SSI recipients who are eligible uh, on the basis of blindness, which is a separate standard from the disability standard. Um, finally, I think the, um, there is a, there's a plan, to call, plan to achieve self-support. Um, this was created because uh, SSI recipients can't really save money with the low asset limit in this program. Um, and it was decided to allow, to create the PASS program to allow SSI recipients to save money for a vocationally achievable and feasible goal. So the plan has to be in writing. It has to be pretty detailed. If it is a, for self-employment, there has to be a business plan. Um, the, it, the writing has to say uh, what the goal is, the steps taken to need it. There have to be milestones, in other words, um, the equipment needed, uh, where the money will come from that the person is going to save. For example, it could be a job that's not going to allow the individual to have a career and be self-supporting. Uh, they could put their funds into the path. And the way it works is that funds that are put into a path do not count as income to reduce the SSI benefit. And if the pass is properly set up and um, the person follows the pass exactly as written, uh, it doesn't, the money put into the pass, which is really usually just a bank account, doesn't count as a resource. Um, the Social Security uh, has, uses a pass cadre to approve these um, passes and check up on them to review them to make sure they are being used as written. Uh, this can be um, a good way for a person to save some money for a vocationally achievable goal, uh, but is not for everyone because it, it does require a fair amount of detail and uh, the ability to follow the plan. So with that, I'm going to switch now to the Title II work incentives, so the SSDI work incentives. Sorry to move so fast on this, but there is a lot to cover. And I want to save a little bit time in case people do have some questions at the end. So the Title II work incentives um, are totally different than the work incentives for people eligible for SSI. Uh, it's the older program, so it started out with different um, um, different rules when, for when people go back to work. And it's not a needs-based program. So, um, you know, for SSI as a needs-based program, it was easy to come up with uh, a deduction for, for um, wage income. Uh, for Title II, we've got some concepts that you can see on the slide currently up. So the one concept is the nine 
nine-month trial work period, which is not so much a nine-month period as a set of nine months um, that are used when a person works at the services level. And we will talk about what that means in a moment. After a person has used all nine trial work months, the next period starts. This is called the extended period of eligibility. Um, the first 36 months of the extended period of eligibility are the re-entitlement period. When an individual is eligible for their SSDI benefit in months when they don't work or if they are working, they are not working at the substantial gainful activity level. Um, and after the 36th month, there's something that we call the cliff, where one month of substantial gainful activity results in termination of entitlement. And of course, we'll talk about the concept of substantial gainful activity as well. And expedited reinstatement also applies um, for SSDI recipients who have worked their way off of benefits. And we'll talk about what that means. So what do SSDI recipients need to know when they're going to work? Well, it's not like SSI where you can say, well, half, about half of your gross monthly wages will count to reduce your SSI. Here, the SSDI recipient needs to know, have they used their nine trial work months? Have they used all of them? If they did, when did they use the nine trial work months? If they still have some, to, some trial work months to use, well, how many do they have left? Um, if they have used all nine trial work months, then they need to know when did my 36-month period of um, uh, re-entitlement period uh, begin or, or is the 30 month, 36 months over. The advice that people get uh, is going to depend greatly on uh, the answers to these two questions. And then, of course, are my countable wages above at or above the substantial gainful activity level? These are the three most important questions to know the answers to. So what's a trial work period? As I said, it's a set of nine months. Um, if you have trial work months to use, you use them with gross earnings at the services level. In 2017, um, the service level for a person who is an employee who gets a, a salary or um, hourly wage is $840 gross. Uh, and this is another one of those numbers that changes every January. Or if a person is in self-employment, um, it's measured by at least 80 hours in, um, in self-employment activities. No deductions apply. This is a low uh, test of the person's ability to work uh, based on this definition of service months. When the person has, not, has trial work months to use, their benefits are payable no matter how much they earn, as long as they remain medically eligible for a benefit. Uh, again, they're only using trial work months if they have them to use, if they have work meeting the definition of services above in that above bullet. And there is only one set of trial work months per period of disability. It's a common misunderstanding that people get a new trial work period, a new set of nine months every time they try a different job. Um, and that's not the case. You only get one set of nine per period of disability. And you can see the regulation cited below um, on the bottom of the slide. Now, the extended period of eligibility, the second um, part of the um, SSDI work incentive begins with the month after the ninth trial work month. So it's critical to know um, when a person uses that ninth trial work month um, because the EPE, the 36-month extended period of eligibility um, or the re-entitlement period begins with the very next month and it runs consecutively whether the individual works or not. And as I said earlier, the SSDI is payable uh, in this period in months when there's no, um, 
no SGA, whether the person is work, not working or working at a lower level than the SGA level, the SSDI is payable. But it is not payable, and people are overpaid when they get their benefit in months, um, in this 36 months, where the SGA level uh, has been met when the person is working at the SGA level. So it's critically important that people report their wages to Social Security so that Social Security can track the trial work months and can also track um, the SGA level and turn benefits on and off um, as appropriate um, to avoid large overpayments of benefits. And then after the 36 months of the re-entitlement period, the extended period of eligibility can continue as long as the individual remains medically eligible and isn't working at the SGA level. However, if the beneficiary does work at the SGA level after the 36 months of the re-entitlement period, the uh, extended period of eligibility closes and entitlement terminates. And if, if benefits don't terminate timely, uh, people will be overpaid for uh, every be every benefit amount they receive uh, after that SGA month until Social Security um, does stop the benefits. And again, this is another reason why it's really important for people to report their wages um, every time there's a change. So what is SGA? Um, it is, it's defined as work involving significant uh, physical and mental activities generally performed for perform for pay or profit. It's largely measured by gross wages. In 2017, uh, substantial gainful activity is presumed uh, with gross wages over $1,170 for those eligible on the basis of blindness, a uh, disability, I'm sorry, and $1,950 for those eligible on the basis of blindness. Now, SGA includes only pay for work done in the month, at work actually done in the month of receipt. So it doesn't include um, sick and vacation pay for those who are uh, lucky enough to have that. So take some care to make sure that Social Security knows um, when a person's pay does include sick and vacation pay. Um, there are some rules, different rules for uh, people involved in self-employment. Uh, I don't have time today to get into those, but uh, just be aware of that. Um, the presumption of SGA can be rebutted, meaning changed, in some circumstances. So if an individual has wages at the substantial gainful activity level, let's say a person gets SSDI, they're in that 36-month re-entitlement period, and their wages are $2,000 a month. Well, if they have um, impairment-related work expenses of $50 a month that Social Security approves as impairment-related work expenses, um, that rebuts the presumption of SGA. Their countable wages for SGA under those circumstances would be $2,000 minus $50, which brings us down to $1,150, which is under SGA for a person eligible on the basis of, of disability. <laughs> In addition, unsuccessful work account attempts don't count as SGA. Uh, an unsuccessful work attempt is a work attempt lasting less than six months that terminated due to disability-related problems. Sometimes people work with subsidies or special conditions such that they may be earning more money for a time um, than the actual amount of work that they're, they're putting in. This obviously requires a specific level of verification if that's, if that's happening. And sometimes there are unincurred business expenses for, for people who are in self-employment. For example, uh, maybe VR is uh, helping them with a, a particular business expense that they would actually otherwise have to um, have to apply have to uh, pay for. Um, so that's how you rebut the presumption of substantial gainful activity in some circumstances. Now let's go back to Joe. We talked about Joe's example earlier. Joe was the gentleman who got uh, some SSI and SSDI and he had wages of $885 a month. Um, that was enough to um, uh, terminate his, his SSI or suspend his SSI because 
the resulting combination of his countable SSDI and his countable wages was more than he could get on SSI. So Joe, as someone who's duly eligible for SSI and SSDI, has to pay attention with both sets of work incentives. So for, um, for Title II, we'd have to look at does he, does he have any, any trial work months left to use? If he does, um, he is using a trial, he's using trial work months, because remember, the services number for 2017 is $840 gross, and he's making $885. So he'd want to make sure to report his wages so that Social Security can count his trial work months. If he's used all nine trial work months in prior work attempts, he might be in the 36 months uh, re-entitlement period, in which case um, 885 gross is less than SGA. So he doesn't have to worry about loss of benefits uh, due to SGA with these current wages. And even if he is outside the 36 months, he's not working at the SGA at, with this level of wages, and uh, so he wouldn't have to worry about <clears throat> immediate loss of benefits. But he must continue to report his wages and any changes to avoid pu future problems uh, with his SSDI. I mentioned that ex expedited reinstatement applies for both Title II and Title XVI disability benefits uh, for people who work their way off benefits. Um, this was um, a program that was created um, to allow people to try work with more confidence. Uh, it's a faster way to re reapply for SSI or SSDI when entitlement terminates solely due to work activity and the disability need for the benefit is the same as the prior time that the person was eligible. It does require that an application be filed for expedited reinstatement within 60 months, five years, of losing SSI or SSDI due to work. <clears throat> and one of the more attractive things about it is that the uh, individual can receive prospective benefits for up to six months after applying while Social Security completes the formal eligibility uh, determination. Okay. And we've talked about the duty to report uh, for SSI and SSDI recipients. Um, representative payees also have to report. They have the same reporting duties for their uh, beneficiaries as the beneficiary has. The actual rule is that uh, beneficiaries and representative payees for beneficiaries must report to SSA anything that might affect benefit eligibility and benefit amount as soon as the change happens. Um, it's, the instruction is to report by the 10th day of the month after the month of the change. But really, the sooner the better. And again, representative payees share the reporting responsibility with benefit recipients. When, when representative payees or beneficiaries report work, <clears throat> Social Security does provide a receipt uh, for the work report. When that receipt comes in the mail um, or is handed to the individual, the individual uh, knows that the report of their work has been entered into Social Security's system, which is the important thing, so that their benefit amount can be um, can be recalculated if necessary. If they don't receive the work report um, a, a week or so after reporting work, they should check in with Social Security because that may mean it didn't get entered into the system and the person could be at risk of overpayment. Um, as you can see, SSI recipients have a lot more reporting to do because there are many other factors besides work that can affect their benefit amount and their benefit eligibility. Um, and Social Security does not, re, re, uh, does not provide receipts for these other kinds of reports. Uh, so it's important for uh, everyone to keep good records about their work and about um, any reporting that they've done uh, for any reason um, so that if something happens, um, they can be able to show that uh, they did what they were supposed to do. 
Now, <clears throat> because these rules are complicated and, and people may need support um, with um, understanding the work incentives, whether it's SSI or SSDI, um, free counseling has been made available um, on the work incentives. This is a program called Work Incentives Planning and Assistance, or WIPA. Um, I think there is a WIPA that is assigned to every state. Most of the programs are in the state in which they do work, although I think some cover more than one state. Um, certified Work Incentive Counselors, CWICs, uh, work in WIPA programs, and they are available uh, for SSI and SSDI recipients who are working or are planning to go into work, not just necessarily thinking about maybe going to work, but are, are working or planning going to work. And they are available to talk to them about their individual circumstances, the benefits they receive, um, uh, the wages they're likely to receive or are receiving and help them um, understand the effect not only on their SSI and on their SSDI but on their Medicaid or their Medicare, um, their SNAP benefits, their subsidized housing. Um, so it can be of really great assistance to, to folks who, who are uh, moving into the workforce. I've supplied the, uh, in the next bullet down, the uh, website where you can find out where the WIPA program serving your state is. Um, and there's also a description of the WIPA programs. And there's finally the last slide is uh, what I think are some useful websites to know about if you don't already know about them. Um, on uh, SSA.gov is a fairly user-friendly uh, website. It has um, a good publications section, uh, a lot of publications in languages other than English uh, and uh, in, available in other formats. Uh, SSA's Red Book on Work Incentives is a pretty user-friendly booklet. You can no longer get it in print, but it is available online and it's kept up to date. Uh, for the changes that that um, that happen yearly, a uh, really good resource. Um, information about the ticket to work uh, is also available. How people get started, um, the options people have at the uh, Choose Work website in the next bullet. And then finally, I provided some links to Social Security booklets on work incentives. These are in pretty simple language, not a lot of detail, but um, they are um, generally helpful to people who are, are thinking about work to get inform and send them in the right direction to get additional information. So that brings us to the end of the slide. I hope this was useful and I'm happy to take any questions that, that people may have. Thank you very, very much, Linda. We appreciate your wonderful presentation. Gabby, are there any questions from participants? No questions so far. No questions. Okay. Um, I did fail to mention earlier that a handout of the slides is available um, for participants. If you go to your participant control panel, there should be a spot to download that PDF of today's slides. Um, and if you do have additional questions, I assume that folks can contact you, Linda, by email? Yes. yes. Is, is my email available to people? Um, was it on your slides? Um, it may not have been. OK. Well, if um, I would offer if folks do have some questions that you'd like me to forward to Linda, please email them to training at nasha.org. That's training at nasha.org, and I'll make sure and forward them to Linda um, so that she can respond directly to the folks that have questions. Thank you. Um, sure. Thank you very much. And we thank you for um, viewing the webinar today. Please join us tomorrow for a webinar presentation by Thomas Murphy, also with the Disability Law Center of Massachusetts entitled Employment Law, 
understanding disability-based discrimination and reasonable accommodation. And we invite you to email us again at training at nasha.org to join our contact list and receive notices of future webinar offerings. And we hope that you'll consider attending the annual State of the States Conference, NASHA sponsored, in Tempe, Arizona on September 11th through the 14th, 2017. For more details on the conference, please visit the NASHA website. And if you're interested in joining NASHA, we'd love to have you. Please contact Lorraine Wargo, our Executive Director. Thank you again for viewing this webinar. And we hope that you'll join us again tomorrow.